and I'd like to call on our panel chairman, chairwoman, expert, Karen May. Karen. For me, it's been a wonderful gathering. Um, we've had such a terrific perspective, I build, I, I think, of building the picture um, in our sector and also looking at some of the new and emerging areas that we can start to think about possibly introducing and reframing some of our models, um, changing some of our emphasis. Some of it is challenging, some of it is um, how do we do that? How do we achieve that? What does that change look like? How am I going to get my boss or, or, or government to uh, see this fantastic light bulb that I've, I've discovered <laughs> over the last two days? But that's what we're here for today, is really to start to have that conversation about sort of two key issues. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce just two speakers uh, to do a bit of a talk around their perspectives on this. But the first issue is how are we going to foster collaboration in research? So research is a sector that often is based either at a hospital or based in a university institution, an academic institution. There's enormous pressure on researchers to publish um, in the name of their university, hold on to that uh, intellectual property, and it sort of goes almost against the idea of collaborating outside of that and, and uh, holding on to that, um, that knowledge. So I guess what we're asking people to do is actually to say, how about we look at actually joining forces with our different disciplines, our different knowledge areas, and what does that look like? And that's actually going to bring a great story for our, our universities, um, our employers, uh, to be able to say, we've been able to create this new model by combining disciplines with this university and that institute and this industry organisation. So that's one challenge that I'm going to put up uh, for you today. The other challenge is about, more about, I guess, our industry, our service provision. Um, how do we take our learnings from the research and then apply them in practice? And that can be directly within our service organisations, that can be directly with our service families, but that can also be with the actual organisations providing services to support those living with injuries, whether they be physical or psychological injuries of their service, how do, how do we as clinicians and service providers actually apply that change? So within that uh, area of practice, it's about building communities, communities of practice. And this is where we've heard a lot over the last couple of days from different disciplines, from, from occupational therapy specialists, from psychiatrists, from psychologists, from trauma-informed psychotherapists, from creative specialists, from physical specialists. We've heard from a whole range of people around these topics. How do we build a community of practice where we start to share that knowledge, perhaps share models, and not just within our own local area, but we need to do that, but also more broadly across the nation and across um, the sea to other countries as well. So I, I think already, just for myself, there's so much learning that I've had today from uh, f over the last two days from the conversations with people and the presentations from people um, in other states and, and other countries. How do we now uh, work together to continue that learning so that we don't have to repeat, repeat that learning um, in our own context, but actually share that learning, fast track that and say, okay, We've also got a great idea over here. How about we build on that? So that's the other challenge I present to you today, is so communities of practice. On that note, I'm going to introduce Robert Lippiet. I've known Robert for a number of years now, and Robert Lippiet served as an inf infantry man in the Australian Army in the early 1970s and has been a strategic business advisor for the past 17 years, working in the area of new service and delivery models in the health, aged, and community care sectors. Advocating in the area of defence and services, community health and wellbeing. He's been involved in national and international initiatives and is currently involved in international projects seeking to link policy, research, service provision and advocacy in new ways to deliver enhanced 
health and wellbeing outcomes for members of the defence and services community. Robert's been an amazing uh, advocate, often self-funded, travelling around the country, hosting meetings with people um, and bringing people together in conversations both in Australia and around the world. Welcome Robert today to talk a little bit about how to broker that knowledge change. I'm actually going to uh, do two, uh, be a two-part thing for me. Um, I just want to sort of set the scene a bit, and then my good friend and colleague Heidi Cram is going to uh, share with you, uh, from the practical point of view, the experiences in the Canadian context of how the, some of these things have played out. Um, I got suckered into this area of, um, like I served uh, a long time ago, and it was something I did once when I was young and sillier and uh, I sort of got on with my life and I got sucked back into this area of military and veterans health about 2003 because somebody found out I was a veteran and, and I might know something about health um, and I haven't been able to escape the vortex uh, yet although I'm, I tried terribly hard about it. Um, it was as I worked in the, in the area that what we were focused on was what I call symptomology so we were looking at uh, particular issues that in a clinical model would be seen today as symptoms and we weren't uh, as I reflect back and I got a bit more smarts I guess was we were treating symptoms and we weren't really going back and fundamentally asking well what's really going on here what's what's actually that causal, or causal factor that's triggering this symptomology uh, so in other words we were saying this person has a diagnosis of this or they've got that condition and we were responding to that and we weren't going back and actually saying well, what might have triggered that what was that and we definitely did not have a restorative care mindset it was just a treatment mindset um, that was in place in 2000 and uh, in, in 2007-8 I was invited onto the board of uh, what was then and is still Australia's largest health and care charity for veterans and um, my task with that why I'd been invited on the board was to lead the strategic review of the entity and, and repositioning it as it transitioned across the, that veteran population as it was changing uh, its shape from being predominantly World War II to post-World War II. And what interested me as I was talking uh, with my board colleagues and with our senior leadership team was about how little we or anybody else seemed to know about this population and what their needs really were. And uh, so uh, I said to the leadership team, right, why don't you go out and talk to all the stakeholders and get their views about what's going on and what the issues are. So they went off and they spoke to Veterans Affairs and Defence and the ESOs and health providers and a whole range of people. And they came back and they consolidated it all. And what interested me as a strategic thinker was um, there was no consistency of view so there was no common view about A, what was going on, and B, what the needs were. But many of the things were contradictory. That one agency or one entity would say, the needs are this, and somebody else would say, no, no, that's not the, it's, it's this other. In other words, we didn't have a common view of what was going on. And so uh, what that led me to say is, look, we've got to change the dynamics here, and we've got to start to look at these things from a different perspective with different eyes but also with different people that in other words people who are not currently invited to be part of the conversation need to be invited into the conversation and so to test a crazy concept that uh, uh, we had used in some other areas I suggested why don't we invite together representatives of government research service provision and advocacy to the one place at the one time and sit in a room like this and actually talk between ourselves and come up with some consensus about maybe what we the issues were and what we needed to do. And that for me was, was the, the, the nascent start of what uh, I've been focused on uh, subsequently. And what we found out of that uh, exercise was a couple of things. Uh, uh, two that are really germane to this conversation today. One is, is that for the first time we had consumer reps, not ESOs as the advocacy, but we actually went out and sourced consumer reps. And it was great that you had a consumer rep to 
in this conference because it's the people who live it that we should be asking them, what's your story? What's going on for you? And they were the most powerful people in that conversation of those 340 people we had on the Gold Coast drawn from Australia and New Zealand. The other thing that was really interesting was among many senior leaders, and I'm talking senior leaders, so uh, in a government agency perspective, we were talking about either the heads of the government agency or the deputy. That's the level of person that was there and their equivalents from the universities, et cetera. And what really interested me uh, as an observer was how often um, observing them in their group, working groups and then subsequently when they spoke to me, how they, they had their eyes open because they heard stuff for the first time they had never heard before. And yet they were working in the area. And what they had heard for the first time was from other people in other domains working on the same sorts of issues who gave their view of the issue and the problem and all of a sudden it was like I've never looked at it from that perspective before. So out of that some good things have, have happened and one of them is was a mechanism that was created and um, it's great that I thank Karen for the opportunity to come chair with you because a lot of what we do is under the radar and it's very deliberately and consciously under the radar because if you're trying to change things, it's about building trust, about building rapport uh, and it's about uh, building confidence. And so we consciously decided not to be out there beating blowing brass trumpets and beating drums. But we've had some really positive outcomes and, and the focus has really been since then about how do we build collaborations, how do we build mechanisms that allow people from those four domains to come into spaces, safe spaces like emotionally, uh, safe spaces to have honest conversations with each other about what th they see is happening what they're seeking to do and to then respectfully listen to their colleagues from those other domains who share the same story, their expectations, their hopes, of whatever they're trying to achieve. And it's out of that process some amazing things have occurred already. Um, and one of the things is I'm, uh, those of you I speak to, I'm a great and powerful advocate for collaborations and, uh, and it's not because I think they're nice, but it's because of what they've been able to achieve. And uh, uh, there are many things I could talk to you about that you may not be necessarily consciously aware of, but where we fundamentally shape, reshaping the agenda in respect of our military veterans and public safety officers and their families uh, across the globe. The participating countries we have in the network now are Initially it was Australia and New Zealand, and then it went to the Five Eyes countries, and we now have uh, two of our close allies in NATO, the Netherlands and Denmark have joined the conversation. And um, I, sometimes I wonder, you know, what, what are we doing here? And then it's uh, because uh, our role is about sponsoring the conversations, it's not to get in and control the conversations or what happens after. So often we don't see what happens after, but it's always so encouraging to me when I hear from people and they tell me what they were able to achieve because of that, being part of that conversation. People they met, organisations they linked with, and then what they've been able to go on and do. So collaboration is really the, the, the powerful focus. Um, and it's at that point that I'd like to invite Heidi up because from the Canadian perspective, there are some amazing stories about how they've used this power of building capacity and colla through collaboration to actually start to uh, move the, the balance, if you will, of uh, not only the discussion and the thinking, but action and response, uh, be, but purely in my personal view, because they've, they have actually discovered the, the power of, of collaboration and the leverage that collaboration actually gives you. So I'll hand over to Heidi and then I'll share with you some what I think are opportunities for you to think about, to talk with your colleagues here, talk within your organisations about and look at how you, well A, whether you want to be part of it, 
and b how you might go about contributing to these sorts of conversations to actually work towards building a better future for this population that we're focusing on and as i like to say i think if we can figure it out answers to help the our target population there are lots of other folks in our community who suffer from similar conditions maybe the the reasons and the, and the drivers of those are different but who would benefit by us then sharing our experiences and knowledge to help them to deal with the issues that they face in their life and that way we become that continuous leverage of service Thanks, Robert. I think it's an incredibly important point to think about how we can translate the learnings from service communities to our civilian society where trauma is the number one mental health issue across our civilian world as well. Um, now, uh, I'd just like to introduce uh, Heidi Cram. Uh, many of you met Heidi over the last two days as, uh, and speaking about the family's research that um, she's done and worked together in collaboration already with uh, people like Nicola Fear from King's College. but. Um, Heidi was also put forward by uh, Dave Pedler, the scientific director of an institute in Canada called the Canadian Institute of Military and Veteran Health Research, um, which uh, they're going in, they've just come out of their big conference and they convene, I think it's 44 universities uh, of collaborating universities in research, which is just amazing. Um, and uh, Dave recommended that uh, he's ho hosting the uh, Boston meeting of the Five Eyes, which uh, Heidi's attending, Nicola's attending straight after this conference, and, and Miranda uh, from Australia to report on, on the Australian context. But uh, we're very uh, privileged to have Heidi here, and that's her other hat she's representing to represent um, Simva and talk about how they've achieved the collaboration in their area. I also come from a clinical background. So I wanted to kind of share a few things um, in reflecting back on the last time I came to Adelaide in 2016 and all the people who, you know, the relationships have grown and then with those relationships, the, the actions and we're moving forward together. So that's, that's uh, been a really, um, really meaningful part of, uh, of work as a researcher and we can't under we, well, we do really undervalue how much time it takes to build that kind of trust and rapport to be able to actually do things. So um, it's been interesting because when we were at the conference in Adelaide in 2016, this was when I was sitting there with my new colleague, Nick Carlton, who was you know, talking about, you know, we should really do something like Simver. You know, we're really trying to figure this out on the public safety. For those of you who remember Nick um, from the, the video, uh, feed. Um, I don't know what day it was anymore. Was that yesterday? That wasn't yesterday. That was yesterday. Okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so the time really becomes very relative, obviously. Um, but we're sitting there, we get these emails, and the emails come from um, the report has now come out of the Standing Committee from Parliament on uh, national security and emergency preparedness. And there is a news release that um, this parliamentary committee has released, and they say, um, SIP cert should exist um, and it shall go forth in collaboration and cooperation with SIMVR. And so at the time, I was a, a co-scientific director of SIMVR and I'm sitting next to Nick and I'm like, no one told me this. Did anyone tell you that? No. Okay, so we have this kind of national um, priority to go ahead and, and figure out how to go forth together. Except that's not such a straightforward thing because everyone's in different funding cycles and of course you've got to, you know, you've got to be able to, to demonstrate what, what you are doing to justify funding and all of those things that we all have to deal with. But also, we're dealing with some different populations and in the broader society, especially in the Canadian context, um, we see, we used to see much more sensitivity about how distinct these populations actually were. So we had to kind of figure out how to do this and in Adelaide, in you know, the bar, yes, this is where all good things happen, apparently, in, in making these uh, kinds of decisions. So we're having a drink. Um, Nick has a very delicate constitution, doesn't travel well. It's probably a good thing he didn't come because he'd have, you know, he'd be all out of sorts. So um, I'll have to tell him that I mocked him on the delicate constitution. I do it regularly, it shouldn't be a surprise to him. Um, so we're talking about how we're gonna do this. Like, what is this gonna look like? And we made a choice that what we were going to do is we were going to build this in a collaborative way. 
And recognizing that that was not gonna be an easy thing and that our universities would probably not want that to happen, but for us to really get there to where we need to go, we need to explicitly make a choice that we're going to actually structure this in a collaborative way. So, you know, how do we as researchers, because there's not enough re researcher time, there's not enough researcher money, so as ethical stewards of the investment in the research, how do we make sure that we get the best yield and make the best impacts and outcomes for the people we're supposed to be serving? So we talked about kind of a shared kitchen model where we look at creating this kind of methods and content overlap for the researchers, but then for the populations, the populations can choose kind of, you know, what storefront they might go to. But that there's a lot of crossover that can be gained from um, the researchers who do similar methods across different populations. So how do we really kind of capitalize on that? Um, so now SIPSERT's been fully funded by the federal government. Um, we also have uh, renewed funding now um, from the Canadian government through uh, Veteran Affairs Canada for another 10 years for SIMVR. And what we see is, you know, an incredible um, series of products around collaboration. And I do think that the, you know, one of the really great examples is in the family space. And f for some of us, it's, it's easier to track because we see kind of when it all started, so it's a, a bit easier to capture. But there's some really great things happening um, in all kinds of different disciplines and professions. You know, we bring together everyone who's working in the space. It's multi-sector. So the people who are, um, you know, deployed in the field, who are supporting people who are deployed in the field, um, families, uh, service providers for families, healthcare providers in uniform, veteran affairs, decision makers, policy makers, researchers, and trainees. And we can't forget about them because if we don't build them up, who's going to do all the work? We've made the case that the work needs to be done, right? So we can't all do it. So it's been quite a remarkable thing that three years ago, this was a conversation over a drink. And now we have these parallel things. And so what we've done is that we actually have one of our streams in our conference is now dedicated to public safety personnel health. So every year we have a full concurrent line through our two and a half days of conference just on public safety health. So we see incredible value across uh, the sectors where, you know, when you have the, uh, the folks saying these are our issues too and these are decision makers in the military and they're seeing the relevance back and forth. So it's, it's mutual benefit and, and high yield. So that's kind of what we're going for. So really when we talk about, you know, how we structure our strategic um, directions. It's really around relationships, research, and impact. So, so Simber as an entity is not a traditional thing like where, you know, we're at Nicola with Kings, there's like a big knowledge production machine. I happen to be a researcher who's producing things, but that's in my queen's hat. But in Simber, it's how to make the connections, build the capacity, and make sure the research is getting to the people where it's going to have an impact. So um, we've spent Five years as kind of a startup getting going, five years really trying to get the lay of the land and make sure we understand what the priorities are and now our next five years is all going to be about action and impact. So I'm not gonna read this. You could read that if you'd like. I would like to say we've got a whole bunch of our domestic universities coming together but we also have quite a number of international affiliates. And so those international affiliates will come and be at our events and be invited to do that. And I think some of that, um, you know, cross-country comparison really adds a lot of value because we can see where the starting point can be for other countries so we don't have to keep reinventing. Um, we do have a lot of connection now. I'll show you one example of kind of how this has come out. This was just a lovely picture of the Student and Postdoctoral Engagement Committee. If you are a trainee, you know, if you're on that track, consider coming to the conference because we are building um, an international network um, in the training, we want to see that connectivity in your training so that you bring it forward into your communities and countries. Um, we see a lot in terms of uh, trying to, to identify things that are emerging, like the newer things. So how do we kind of get ahead of things that are, are, are problematic for loads of folks? In Canada, there was this decision made to, you know, um, legalize cannabis. That's got some implications. Right? So, and understanding the science around uh, the use of cannabis and um, how it can affect 
performance, but also how it can affect people who are already um, experiencing psychological issues. So there's, there's a lot of energy going towards that. There's a lot of energy going towards suicide prevention um, and understanding best practice and comparison. So there's a lot of this liaising and connectivity. So this is a big part of it. And so it's not workloaded for us as researchers, not really, but it takes an, a tremendous amount of time. Um, I mentioned in terms of the, the research streams. So we have a full stream dedicated to family research and a full stream dedicated to public safety. So it's a mixed, mixed thing. So it's all types of research relevant to the population. And we have our um, journal. So this is, I, I, you know, I, sorry, I mentioned this before. This is where you'll find research on families. And, you know, so, you know, we're growing, um, we're growing the journal all the time. So th that's one thing that we have and, and, and form really is our flagship event where you get to have all those conversations and you get to, to meet all those people. And it cannot be um, overemphasized just how impactful that is. So all the opportunities that you've created for us to get to know each other better here are going to pay dividends so that in three years we're going to look back and go, wow, imagine, who could have imagined where we'll be in three years? Like it's a very exciting time. And so this is one example of things that we couldn't have imagined three years ago. So this is a partnership that we are starting between um, Simber as researchers, um, government, military, family services, Callion, which is a um, industry representative, they provide, they have the contract to provide military, um, military family physicians to, um, family physicians to military families. So it's a, it's a hard thing. We have to cross <coughs> um, provincial jurisdictions and our families have a really hard time finding primary health care. It's a, it's a huge issue for our families. So they have a, uh, like an expedited type of structure so that you can, you can find a family doctor. Um, and then the Vanya Institute. So what we've been able to do now is to try to build the infrastructure for us to get the research that is sufficient quality um, to be able to go out into a knowledge translation system to give the military family doctors what they need to understand how to have that health care. But we also have built um, these knowledge products that are companion pieces because it's not all about the provider. It's also giving the military family member um, a way of having an interaction with the healthcare provider that allows it to be a respectful one, that we don't play into the stereotypes that we see of you know military families are either resilient over here or they're broken over here and nowhere in between. So we've really worked at creating a culture of shared responsibility about making those things happen as well. But it's, it's uh, three years ago, no way. So in three years, this should be um, a really interesting model that we've been able to scale up and add other elements that are all already underway, like um, transitions into primary health care from veterans for, vet for people releasing. So they're coming from a national health care service, but now they're going into a provincial publicly funded health care service. That comes with a whole set of skills and uh, disconnects as well. So I will leave you with those as examples. Um, so thank you. So that's a great example um, uh, coming out of our 2016 International Leaders Forum uh, here in Adelaide where we had 110 or 112 senior people from those four domains I mentioned from um, uh, four country, uh, five countries, six countries um, here in Adelaide and uh, we talked about w the power of change and um, the other thing that came out, Heidi mentioned one, which is a great example of how when you get people together and you stimulate their thinking with different perspectives, what energy you actually create. In other words, you unleash within them um, those creative forces. The other great thing that came actually out of that 2016 uh, conversation of those senior leaders was we actually decided, or they decided, that we needed to move to a well-being focus. Instead of having a, a, a health and sickness focus that was reactive, that we needed to move to a well-being focus that was proactive. Uh, and that was also about the whole of life of the individual not and the family unit, not just uh, a particular event or a point in time, 
that it was really about the whole of the life of the individual. Now that was a lofty goal and um, we thought, right, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and interestingly enough, a lot has happened. There's been some amazing work done in Canada built out of this engine the, of Simva, um, which is a fantastic example of a collaboration hub. As Heidi said, not many people, it doesn't do the research, but it's become an amazing resource for building capacity and harnessing energy and focusing it. And uh, so they've done an amazing piece of work around well-being uh, for this population that we're talking about. Um, that's now been leveraged up in the UK at the moment, uh, who uh, they're doing some additional work around that and they're starting to look at what outcomes look like uh, and then how you would go about measuring outcomes. So out of a little conversation of 110, 112 people here in Adelaide, drawn from different backgrounds, different countries, sitting together, listening to each other, talking with each other, uh, some amazing things from the big scale, the well-being to the very practical outcomes that Heidi spoke about have come. And so they're great examples of collaboration and I could share more with you that have occurred since. Um, and there are some amazing things that are going on uh, out in the ecosystem that are about building collaboration and capacity. Uh, one of them I'll give a plug to at the moment is uh, the Catalyst was out in New Zealand and my good friend uh, Dr. Um, Professor Dave McBride is one of my co-plotters and schemers. Um, give a wave, Dave, because I'm going to do a plug on you. Um, and we, w w to uh, um, around some issues in this space, it was really about how do we get an alternative conversation happening. And so uh, the, 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 the government people asked a crazy person, me, um, how would they deal with it? And I said, well, if you ask me, you're not going to get the conventional answer. So uh, we, the answer was, let's explore educating people uh, to create an educated and informed group that then can have sensible conversations. And they said, so you want to run a conference? And I said, no, uh, why don't we explore the power of technology? And, now, and, th and the reason I raise this, because I think this is the other dimension around building collaborations, that we now have the capacity for collaborations to be separated in time and space. And so what we put together and uh, will run out till August next year is a webinar series of eminent thought leaders around a range of topics uh, that are appropriate to this population of military veterans and public safety officers and their families. Um, where we've had an amazing, um, amazing feedback already from the series which started in August uh, and um, we'll, we'll move on into 2020. Uh, those webinars uh, actually, uh, and this is the PR plug, if you're interested in being invited to be part of it, it's an invite process, um, not because we want to make it exclusive, but um, we didn't necessarily want to go out and stand on the street corner and then we have people come who are voyeurs. Because one of the great things about if you're really about change and you're about collaboration, you don't want voyeurs. You're either a player or a person who's exploring, wanting to, to be involved. You don't want voyeurs. Um, and uh, so uh, if, you, if this sounds critical or cynical, I don't mean it to be, voyeurs suck the life out of, out of these exercises because they, they want to talk, they don't want to do, and collaborations and all these sorts of things that we're talking about are about people wanting to do things and leverage up what they have. So um, that webinar series is running at the moment. As I said, um, we're currently over doing an overarching view about life transitions and what are the issues around that and what people have learnt already across uh, a number of countries and we've had the country experience. Falling out of that, we've had requests for some special things. So we'll be having one on an amazing project that's going on in the US at the moment, which was seeded by some work in Canada coming out of that network, Simba network where they're actually looking at issue of suicide and now self-harm. But, but they're doing it from the point of view of, of not that suicide itself, it's that suicide is the sign we fail that individual somewhere else in the chain. In other words, there was some, it, this is the belief or the hypothesis that something happened with that person at a point in time which set them on the path where they felt that suicide was the answer to their problem. So we need to understand that and come back into it. So 
So we we'll have that and then a range of other things. And then in the new year, there'll be about families and Heidi will, and a number of the colleagues will be sharing their insights around some things there. But it's also about the opportunities that, that are opened up. So there are things like this that are happening. Um, the other thing that I want to plug for those of you who are in the research community or you're in, the, in a, um, a business community, a uh, philanthropic community, or uh, uh, an agency that has an interest because your employees are affected. Um, we're looking at establishing a hub uh, along the lines of Simva in that would serve Australia and New Zealand. Now, maybe we won't be as sophisticated as, as Simva, uh, at least initially, but what we want to look at doing is can we get parties who are interested in this together and uh, if you're interested in joining our little merry band of um, uh, subverters of the system, please see Dave, because one of the things that we're kicking it off is, is that uh, Dave from University of Otago is signing MOUs to get people to start to sign MOUs to work together. Uh, so if you're from university, independent research institutes, as I say, philanthropics, anybody who has an interest in it, if you want to be a partner in this, um, then we'd love you to explore with us signing an MOU to become part of the network that hopefully then will lead to us developing our own hub in this part of the world to, to do a Simba. So the challenges are, uh, and this is the last bit of the sermon, um, leadership is the key. One of the things is uh, we, have, we need leadership, uh, and I like to say, but a new form of leadership not the sort of leadership which says we do more of the same because it's comfortable and it's what I know and it doesn't disrupt the status quo. So we need leaders who really question, who think, and we need leaders in each of those domains who are willing to do that. The other thing we need to be looking at doing more of is harnessing the passion, uh, the passionate people. Uh, they're the ones that energy. That story that Heidi said happened because it was a group of passionate people having a few drinks spinning over the, the thoughts that had been given to them in the day, in the couple of days, and the conversation they'd had, and those passionate people took that and then said, well, let's do something with that. Uh, they didn't have anything to start with, but they made something happen. Um, it's about being holistic and understanding the need to, to be responsive to holistic solutions, not um, uh, single solutions. The uh, collaboration... Uh, but that not just any collaboration, it's got to be directed collaboration. So collaboration that's focused on a common purpose to achieve an outcome. The other thing is that, as Karen said, um, it's really also about, it's great to acquire knowledge, but how do we disseminate that out to the people who need to know it? So we've got to start thinking in our hubs about how we translate this knowledge and how do we share it, how do we give it away? How do we get people on board? How do we help them to understand? How will we help them to use it? Um, and then uh, we need to focus on inclusion and not exclusion. So how do we open this up to make uh, uh, people feel that they are welcome and their organisations are welcome to contribute and be part of this process somewhere in the value chain? So they're my challenges to you as people who've come here to learn, but also who are aspiring or are leaders where you are. And remember, uh, one of the great management um, uh, um, lecturers um, uh, at the moment, I, I subscribe to a guy called John Maxwell, who has this uh, maxim that he says, you can lead from wherever you are. You don't need to have a rank, you don't need to have a position you can lead from wherever you are. So I want to leave that with you and say, each of you are a leader in your own way where you exist, and I encourage you to go away. Think about everything you've heard here over these couple of days. Hopefully, a couple of things that we've said to you this morning will spark something and go away and seek to show leadership wherever you are in whatever context you find yourself. And thanks for sharing uh, with you this morning. Thanks, Robert, and thanks, Heidi. Um, so, some great thoughts there around leadership and uh, 
how to broker that change and also uh, great to hear from Heidi and the developments happening in Canada with a uh, 10 year anniversary I believe uh, for Simva this year and um, I was fortunate enough to have a, a teleconference with Alice Aiken, the founder or one of the founders of um, Simva and um, Alice was one of the first women to serve in the Navy in Canada and she uh, you know, I, I was just in total admiration of this network of, of universities uh, working together. And she said, you know what, it started with just one or two of us. And we basically lobbied government and look where we are now in, in, in 10 years and with institutes specialising in families, institutes specialising uh, in first responders. So I think it's a real vision and the fact that you're all here today um, uh, is an a, a tribute to that, that we, we can do it here too.